Okay, I just did a refresh. Can y'all hear me better now? Okay, okay. Yeah, I refreshed my internet. So hopefully it'll be better, okay? Um, so, kind of understand about the reflective essays and the discussion forums and all that kind of stuff. Any questions about those before I move on? Hi, Ms. Uh, Johnson. This is Tito. How are you? I'm good, Tito. Good to see you. Yeah, um, I'm from, um, I live in D.C. now, so um, I moved here two years ago. But anyway, well, my quick question to you, um, regarding the, um, the case study, so in the event that, you know, we will not be able to get a perfect score, um, let's say, for example, we were not able to email you ahead of time, and then we just go ahead and submitted it, and then, you know, there are some revisions. Will you allow us to do a... Um, uh, to do uh, the redo the, the work? Yeah, I do allow resubmissions on the major assignment. So yes, you can absolutely submit it and it's a score. Now, how do I say this best? So let's say, I don't even remember cut off, quite frankly, guys, it's been a long day. Um, I think this is worth like 100 points. If I give you 96 out of 100, I'm not gonna let you resubmit to get the full point. But if you did really badly or, you know, if you got a B and you really wanted an A, I will be happy to let you to read the book. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think this is um, 70 points uh, okay. for our case study, if, if, Thanks, if I'm <laughs> right. Um, can I do a follow-up question? Sure. Okay, so a follow-up question would be, um, I understand for our reading this of uh, Module 4, is that also... Um, is the deadline also this coming Sunday, which yes. is chapter four? Yes, it okay. is. Okay, thank you, perfect. Sure. And I see that Chantel asked if you've already said, sorry guys, my webcam's over here, but your screen's over here, so that's why you're seeing the side of my face, hopefully. Um, so if you've already submitted your assignments um, and you want me to give you some feedback, you are welcome to do that. Um, and then if you need to make changes or whatever, I will unlock your submission so you can resubmit. Okay. Miss Tracy, can we ask questions about the case study? Or are you not ready for that yet? No, of course. Okay, I have several questions. Um, my first question is, um, do we, it's unclear and several people have asked on the discussion forum about whether or not we are to submit just the PowerPoint or if we're supposed to submit the PowerPoint and the individual assignment data planning. Um, thanks, Ann, that's a good question. Um, the only thing you have to submit is the PowerPoint, okay? okay? You don't have to submit the template, just like all those tools, you do not have to submit those. However, if you want to do the tools and send them to me, you can get extra credit. And I will give you up to five points extra credit that I add to your final total score. So for example, if you end up with 356 points, and you really want that A, you can do all those tools, send them to me, and I'll give you five extra points, which would push you up to 361, which moves you from a B to an A. So okay, we and don't like submit the template groups. Like, will the entire group get the extra points? Yes, yes. Okay, then my last question. Um, and before we leave that though, um, if you're working in a group, which I encourage you to do, this is a mammoth project. Each person in the group will need to submit the PowerPoint individually, okay, in Moodle. Okay. Each person would then need to email me the tools. That way, that's the only way I can track the grading, if that makes sense. Otherwise, sure. um, since I didn't set groups in Moodle for the assignment, um, that's the only way I can do it. Otherwise, it just gets completely messed up. Yeah, sure. So, and then my last question is, uh, you want us to do reference, like a list of references. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but if we're using the data that you gave us, that like you supplied, how would we, what references would we, how would we reference that? Um, if you look at, I don't know how many of you guys use um, Purdue's writing lab, it's called OWL. Uh -huh. um, there is a section that talks about in that how to cite like something that you got from your professor or in a class or whatever. So it's a really okay. simple reference. It would just be Johnson, Tracy, and then the name of the resource, and that's it. <laughs> so very simple. Okay, great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I thought I heard somebody else trying to chime me. in with a question. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so we are in a group and we've been working on our template. Is that, we thought that had to be turned in as well. Your You're saying no? No, your template, again, what I'll do is, normally I have you turn in both. But I know everybody's got all this craziness going on with school trying to start. I know they just delay school to here, and I, I, I know it's crazy. So the only thing that you submit is the PowerPoint. If you do the tools, I will give you five extra credit points. And the if template want, is considered a tool? No. If you want to send me just the template and not the tools, I'll give you three extra credit points. Okay? Um, and as far as somebody's asking, are all the tools and the template for extra credit due this Sunday? No. Um, as long as I have them the final week of the course, I will still give you credit for them, the extra credit. Just don't send it to me the Friday or Saturday. <laughs> That's the last two days of the course because I won't have time to get it all graded in, in, in person. Okay? So the only thing that you have to, to submit and turn in by 11.30 p.m. Central Standard Time on Sunday is the PowerPoint and the reflective question response. If you turn in the template and or the tools, you can do both and you can earn eight extra points. Um, you, um, that's just due sometime during that last week of class. So let's say it's due by Thursday, the last week of class, which is gonna be on the, what would that be? The 20th, so it's due by August 20th. Um, Stacy wants to know, since there's seven tools, how many need to be completed to get the five extra points? You have to do all of them. If you do a couple, I just kind of prorate it accordingly. Does that make sense? So if you do three, you know, I'll have to look and decide how many points I'll give you. So far, I've had one person do this and she sent me all seven. Any other questions about the assignment? Just one question, uh, Miss Tracy. Um, I think it was asked by uh, Brittany. Um, I, I just feel that it's important. So she said the only thing going on in the PowerPoint are the 10 reflective questions, correct? Yes, that is correct. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, and so when you're doing your PowerPoint, you can also include a reference slide in there to handle your references, okay? Um, I'm not going to get real hung up on in-text citations in the PowerPoint. Um, if it makes sense to put them there, do, but I'm not going to count off if you don't do in-text citations, but I will count off if you don't have a reference slide or a reference page. Okay. And hey, Ms. Tracy, one more question. Yes. When we're doing the slide, um, I'm like putting the question at the top and the answer under it. Is that what you're envisioning? That's fine. Um, okay. You can do it that way. Um, there's, you know, there's a million different ways to format a PowerPoint, but if that makes sense to you, that is absolutely fine. I okay. don't get real hung up on um, what's the word I'm looking for. Um, how you develop your PowerPoint, as long as you're answering those questions, and I can tell you're answering those questions, that's fine. Um, okay. So, Thank you. I'm looking at these over here. Um, so does each group, member of the group, have to create an individual PowerPoint? No. So let's say you have five people in your group. I will, you will submit, each one of you will submit the PowerPoint. It will be the exact same PowerPoint for all five of you. Um, I would encourage you on the, the first slide of your PowerPoint to include your group members' names, just so that I can kind of track it accordingly, okay? Um, let's see. 
Yes, the PowerPoint and reflective responses are due Sunday. Tools are due are a bonus. Tools in the template are a bonus, not due until um, August 20th. Um, uh, so how many slides? Um, at the minimum 10, no more than 20. Um, I think I said 10 to 20 and then 10 to 16. Again, minimum 10, no more than 20. And you don't get more points if you do 20 than if you did 10. It's about content. Okay. Any other questions, guys? Because I'm, I'm more than happy to answer any questions you have because I want you to do great on the case study. Miss Tracy. Yes, ma'am. Hey, Brittany. Hey. Um, I think you said, I'm not sure, that the next case study, the one that opened up in module four, builds off of the first one. Is um, that? Hang on one sec. Let me switch screens here and I'll show you. Is that being done individually or in groups as well? Um, hang on one sec. Okay. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to share it so everybody can see it. Um, so I'm going to share the sample. So give me one second here to share on my computer if I can find that. There it is. Sorry, I've got two screens going, and sometimes I can't see what I need to see on either one of them. <laughs> Use my toolbar to share, 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 share. Oh, okay, here we go. Sorry, guys, it took me a second. Okay, so hopefully you're seeing the screen that says the midterm case study assignment. And I'm going to pull up the self evaluation document. And so this is just the um, This is the sample. Um, so, you know, if you like to use exemplars or models. This is what you can use to complete it. Um, so ideally, you're going to use your own school's data. So what I would do is all the information and data analysis and stuff you did um, in um, the case study number one, I would just follow through with this. Um, so again, you're going to fill in all of this information. You're going to look at your enrollment. Um, some of you may not have data that's broken down by male or female. Some states do that. Some schools do that. Some don't. Um, if you don't have a data element um, that is being asked for, just put NA, um, not applicable. Um, so for example, um, uh, I know in Texas, they don't break it down by Pacific Islander. Um, that's not one um, that they use. Um, so I would just put an NA for male and female. Um, the same thing is true. If you don't know how many students are on 504 plans, you don't know suspensions or retentions, that information, that's fine. Just put NA. Okay. And how, where do we get this information from our schools? Um, most cases, if you go to the state um, website, um, so like in Louisiana, it's called Louisiana Believes. Um, in Texas, it's the Texas Education Agency website. Most states have um, an education website, and if you just do a Google search, you know, put in the state name and, you know, state education website or whatever, they will break this kind of information down for you, either through something called a report card, um, a data run, or whatever. Now, like I said, this this particular template is very, very specific. Um, and if you don't have access to this kind of data, that's fine. I'm not going to penalize you. You can only work with what you have. If you're using one of the data sets that I've given you, you're going to have pretty much um, all of this data and information. Okay. So then what is distinctive about your school? So if it's your school, you obviously know <laughs> some of these things. Um, if it's a school you're not familiar with, I would just do some research again. Um, so, for example, one of the data sets I gave you guys for middle school is Benton Middle School here in Bossier City, Louisiana. Um, if I do a Google search, I'll find out that they have um, the state championship archery team, that um, they, um, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not as familiar with Benton Middle School as I am Benton Elementary, but um, you'll see lots of information you can put in there. You don't have to list 100 things. You don't have to list even a particular number. But just give me some sense of what makes this particular school unique. Okay. Um, how do you know? So, you know, um, see the responses, what are your notable strengths? And again, you know, this is basically just reiterating kind of what you put up here. Okay. 
So if you list, let's say 15 things here, you may want to narrow this down to the five most important. So what do you think areas for improvement? Um, most schools, it's actually if they're a Title I school in particular, they're required by law to post their school improvement plan or their campus improvement plan, whatever you call it, um, on their website. Um, so you should have access to that. If you don't and it's your own school, you probably know what their, their areas are that they need to work on. Um, the data sets I gave you, again, a Google search will pull up those campuses improvement. So again, you know, you can use this as a model. Some of this information is going to be very much the same. And like I said, it, it's really very subjective. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to be like, you know what, they chose, I'll pick on one of my own schools, MacArthur High School in Irving. And one of the things that's distinctive about that school is it was a national room school of excellence, and they didn't put that on there. That's not what I'm going to do, guys. I'm really just looking to make sure you're understanding and applying what's most critical. Okay. So I'm not going to walk you through all this, but if you guys have specific questions about this particular assignment or document, um, if I worked by myself on the first case study, can I join a group on the second one, or do I need to just um, do it alone? Hi, Kaylee. Um, I, I think you can absolutely join a group. <laughs> um, again, this is a massive, massive um, assignment. Um, so I highly encourage you guys to work in groups. Um, people have been posting, I know, in the instructor virtual um, office, uh, looking for group members. Um, and if you're already in a group or whatever, you know, maybe reach out to Kaylee and ask her to join you guys too. Um, but yeah, either one's fine. Um, and I did, like I said, I encourage you to work in groups. Um, it'll be the same <coughs> excuse me, issue. Each group member will need to submit um, the templates individually, um, even though it'll be the same for every single group member. Okay? Um, you can use the same school as you did in the first case study, or if you want to switch to a different school, that's fine too. Um, if you're really struggling to find the data that you need, um, you may want to switch to it. Um, I will tell you, um, only because I know this firsthand, if you go to the Dallas ISD website and you look at some of their schools, they have, they're a little bit older now, they're probably maybe three to four, maybe even five years old, they have what they call campus data packets that are extremely, I mean, they're like 40 pages long. There's more data in there than you could ever possibly want, but it will make doing this much easier. Um, other districts and schools may do that. I just know for sure that Dallas has those. So it's just dallasisd.org. And then you can do the search bar campus data packets, um, and you'll get a listing of 205, 210 schools. Um, yes, you can also use the data I provided for the second case study. Um, how many people should a group consist of, Max? You know, I'm not going to set a limit, but I will tell you if there's 40 people in the group, um, that's probably not good. Um, I would say keep it 10 or under. Um, just because, I mean, the whole idea, guys, is I want you to learn something from this. And if you have 40 people in the group, that means each person does, you know, not even one section kind of thing. And I want you to really understand how to do this. Um, for those of you that aspire to be principals or assistant superintendents or superintendents or a coach or whatever in the future, you're going to spend a lot of time doing stuff like this. So I want you to understand it. Um, and also too, if you know, how impressed would your principal be if you're a teacher that you come back and go, look what I did, um, you know, to start the school year. So it, it's really more about the learning. Um, okay, I already see some people negotiating groups. That's awesome. Oh, thank you. And Marissa also in the chat um, shared um, the link for the enrollment data for Louisiana schools. So if you're wanting to do that, you can just pull that up. Thank you, Marissa, that's awesome. Any other questions about the assignment, guys? Going once, going twice? Okay. So what I want to do now is let's just kind of walk through, hang on, let me close some of my screens off guys real quick. 
let's talk a little bit about the PowerPoint for tonight. And I've, again, I'm having these crazy issues with sharing. So let's see if I can share my screen. Okay. So I'm not going to uh, read. Can y'all see the PowerPoint okay? Thumbs up? Okay, thank you. So I'm not going to read this to you. You guys are, you know, graduate students, you're intelligent, all of that. Um, but just to kind of give you an idea. Hang on, let me start from the beginning. There we go. All right, so let's talk for a minute about data analysis. There's a lot of um, misinformation, I guess, out there about data and how to analyze it effectively and use it. Um, but, you know, I, this little graphic, I think, really sort of sums up why data is important. Um, so data gives us information. That information leads to knowledge. Once we have that knowledge and we apply it and use it, we then generate more data. So it's very cyclical in nature. Also too, you know, in the book, Data Driven, um, you know, by Paul, uh, by Paul um, Bamberg, um, he talks about what it means to really be a data-driven school. Um, it's sort of become a catchphrase. Um, I think some of you are aware, I, I, I oftentimes, I have a consulting company, and so a lot of times I do grant reviews for the U.S. Department of Education. And I just finished a, a round of those. And I thought it was really interesting how many people used or described their schools as data-driven. But then the evidence that they gave um, to support that they were a data-driven school absolutely showed they were not a data-driven school. So it's sort of become a catchphrase. But in, in the real world of being a data-driven school, there has to be action behind that data. So data is a way that we know we express numbers um, in quantifiable ways. Um, but data by itself is very, it's really not useful to us. Even historical data is not terribly useful, or useful to us. Um, so I know a lot of principals, I was guilty as well, you know, spend the first day of you know teacher professional development reviewing all the data from last year that's great you know certainly you want to look at some trends you want to do some celebrations etc but that is historical data so for example the algebra results that the school got from last year those aren't the same students who are taking algebra this year so if, for example, um, your algebra students didn't do very well on solving polynomial equations, that doesn't mean that your students that are in algebra this year are going to have the same issues. So we have to also understand the context. We have to be able to use that analysis to interpret the data in meaningful ways. Data is essential. Um, to be used in schools today, as well as in businesses and other entities. We also need to make sure that our data is organized. So we have to look at how we're going to organize that and transform that data into usable elements and pieces. So if you think about how we weed, there are schools that, um, based on their knowledge and how they apply things, they're going to fall into one of four quadrants. So Michael Dillon talks about in Leading in the Culture of Change that knowledge really is a social process. So if you're a knowledge-driven school who is also data-driven, you're going to analyze, discuss, and disseminate your data through collaborative teams. So for example, what I would do if I were still a high school principal now is I would break that data into pieces. And I would give that algebra data to my algebra teachers. They're going to discuss it. They're going to analyze it. They're going to look at it. They're going to decide what applies or what is a trend over time, how that's going to apply to how they teach this year. They're going to own it. I don't need to do all that data disaggregation. I'm going to do some of it because I need to know where we stand as a leader. But I'm going to let the people closest to the problem actually own their own data. When we do that, we move from a rule-driven rule -driven school or a tradition-driven school or even a conflict-driven school into the quadrant of leadership D that is the most effective. That is where we create a culture that embraces collaboration, knowledge, and information 
across every single member of the faculty and staff. The information and data is not owned by a single person. It's owned by multiple people within the, the institution. We also know that the only reason we should be doing data analysis is to improve instruction, as well as to improve elements of the school's culture. Now, a lot of times people get confused about the difference between climate and culture. Climate is a very specific thing, and it's basically, in a nutshell, the feeling you get in a school. So, for example, I can walk into a campus, um, even if it's one I've never been to before, and within five minutes, I can tell you what the climate is. Climate is that feeling. Culture is something that is much more deep-rooted and deep-seated within the school. Culture is the how we go about doing the work. How do we address our students? How do we work on instruction? How do we feed data? All of those kinds of things. So data analysis is critical as a part of building that positive school culture. So oftentimes we quote, analyze data, and we're like, oh, done that, check it off, and we move on. But in reality, data analysis is the first step to designing quality instruction. If we don't analyze the data and know where our students are, understand where they want to go and where we need them to be, then we're wasting our time. That's why I say, Historical data is only marginally useful. What really matters is a tight alignment between the curriculum, the instruction, and real-time assessment to see where our students are and to look at their progress across time. So whether it's progress monitoring, benchmarking, whatever, that's the kind of data that we should be spending the most time looking at, using, and understanding. We also know, just like this project, that collaboration is critical to really doing the most effective kind of data analysis. So when we collaborate in groups and we look at and share assessments, curriculum standards, as well as the data, then that's when we move to the highest level of understanding and we'll see the biggest gains in student achievement. So when you're doing data analysis, for those of you that have taken EDL 700 with me, or if you're in it now, um, you know, uh, DeFore talks about that there's three questions that should be asked with an effective PLC. The same thing's true when your PLC or your professional learning community is analyzing data. What's working, what's not working, and what are we gonna do about it? So for example, we find out that we gave, um, I'll go back to my algebra example, we did a benchmark in algebra um, come about October, and we found that about 60% of our students didn't do well on the statistical analysis portion of the benchmark. So now that we know that, that's a pretty high percentage. So we have to look at that and ask ourselves, okay, so for the 40% who mastered that standard or that concept, what did we do that worked? But for the 60% who didn't, what did we do that's not working? So you delve deeply into the instruction. You might wanna look at student work samples. You might wanna look at how that was assessed on the benchmark to determine what worked and what not. Once we have a pretty good understanding and responses to those two critical questions, the next step is what are we gonna do about it? So how are we going to plan instruction to reteach and remediate for those students who didn't master? What are we gonna to do to enrich those students who did master that particular standard? And how are we going to make sure that they maintain and master that standard until we get to the big assessments at the end of the year? We know too that data meetings are critical. And, you know, I've given you a picture here of what a really effective data meeting might look like. Um, data meetings should occur approximately every two to three weeks, um, or at least at the minimum twice during a grading period. And this should be sacred time. And it should focus only on data. I can't tell you how many data meetings I've walked into and everybody's talking about, so what are we gonna do for the field trip next week? Um, you know, how much money do we have left in the budget? Etc. 
if this should be a sacred time where all we're doing is looking at, talking about data, and asking ourselves what worked well, what's not working, and what are we going to do about it? Data meetings, if you're in a professional learning community um, and you meet, let's say, every week, data meetings are the foundation of the rest of the work you're going to do in that professional learning community. <laughs> um, I'm not going to read all this to you, but you know, for all of those things that um, you may learn um, when, we, when you go into professional learning communities, et cetera, you know, we know big meetings have agendas with time limits, roles and responsibilities. There should be established norms um, and expectations. Um, we should use, you know, agreed upon protocols. You can use them from DataWise. Uh, in your textbook from uh, uh, Bambrick, there's some really great protocols and tools that you can use. Um, it also, as we said, and I can't reiterate this enough, we have to identify the strengths, weaknesses, and the reteaching needs. So you'll see up here um, a data meeting agenda um, that you may find helpful. Uh, you know, so what do we do in tier one? Uh, what do we do in tier two? What does that look like? So tier one focus, um, you know, maybe those students who, um, you know, need to improve um, and we have to do differentiated instruction. Um, our group, our second focus, uh, the tier two kids are those that we need to find them and just watch them. Um, so it can be very simple, but Regardless, whatever you do when you focus on data, it will have a very, very profound impact if done well with instruction. So how do you establish long-term achievement? Um, so, you know, when we're talking about achievement over time, we can do remediation. We spend a lot of time, unfortunately, remediating. But if we're really going to improve and establish achievement over time for all children, it starts with good first instruction. So when we spend time in data analysis and we design the most effective lessons and activities and assignments that we possibly can, we can ensure that that first instruction will meet the needs of 90 plus percent of our students. The way that we do that is we have to make sure there's a strong alignment in what I call the CIA triad. You have to make sure, that's why we spend time talking about curriculum, instruction, and most of all assessment. So if we don't understand what a particular test is, is um, measuring or how it's being measured, we have to, if we don't understand that piece, then we can't ensure that the curriculum we're using is going to meet that need. We also can't effectively plan instruction. So even though the CIA triad or triangle makes all parts equal, it all begins with assessment and data. Once we understand the assessment, what's being measured, how it's being measured, we then have to look at the curriculum. That curriculum uses standards. So for example, you know, um, many states will give you a breakdown of how many of each standard and how many questions are asked about that standard. So if you have the ability to look at a release test or a previous test or whatever, you've got to go in and look at, okay, so question number five relates to standard number 210. How are they, how are they assessing that? What is the question asking? What kind of knowledge and information do students need to be able to effectively answer that question? Then we have to break that standard into its component pieces so that we really understand the depth and complexity of what that standard is expecting students to know. Once you understand those two pieces, that morphs into the development of effective curriculum. If we have an effective curriculum that is aligned to the assessment, then we can plan in effective instruction. We also have to remember that the focus is on teaching, but mostly on learning. So what your students are doing is way more important than what the teachers do. So for example, when I would do classroom walkthroughs, I never ever paid much attention to what the teacher was doing, quite frankly, unless they were sitting behind their desk, you know, with a newspaper kind of thing. I always talked to the students and I asked them three things. I would ask them, what are you learning? 
Why is it important to learn this? And how do you know if you've learned it or not? If the students could answer those three questions, I knew that this was a very effective lesson, there was very effective instruction, and there was a highly effective teacher. If the students couldn't answer those questions, then I knew there was a breakdown somewhere between curriculum, instruction, and assessment. So you can read this about the power of teacher teams and why they're important. Um, but you know, one of the things that I, I really believe makes a huge difference to improve instruction is really coaching. And coaching in the moment is probably the most effective piece. So what I mean by that is, for example, um, one of the things that um, you know, I coach my teachers to do is we wanted to do frequent checks for understanding. So whether it was a thumbs up or, you know, show me on your whiteboard or tell me, you know, which question is correct with your fingers, whatever. Um, when I was going to classroom and let's say that I was, I was looking specifically to see how we were doing with text for understanding and I noticed a teacher was struggling with that. We developed this sort of system where I would just sort of step in and I would demonstrate in live time, real time with instruction, how to do that check for understanding. So it may be something like the teachers just um, talk them through the cycles of photosynthesis. So I, and if she was about to move on to the next concept that she forgot to do a quick check for understanding. So I would step in right there seamlessly and demonstrate. So it may be students, you know, give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down, or, you know, you can always do the neutral, which is, you know, your thumb to the side, um, you know, da, 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 da. Then the teacher would come right back in and I would stand at, you know, where, at the back of the room and I would give the teacher hand signals basically, um, you know, do a check for understanding right now. Then when she would do it, I would give her a thumbs up, um, you know, if it worked well, whatever. But that coaching in the moment proved to be the most powerful thing we've ever done. Um, and we went from an acceptable school to an exemplary school just with those little tweaks in instruction. So um, you did have to write about and read about the power of data stories. Um, data stories are really powerful, even you know, with your faculty and staff, but also with parents um, at a PTA meeting, um, with students if you want them to understand, et cetera. But very, very powerful. So I'm not going to walk you through all this because you guys have had, um, you know, you, you've watched the video and stuff like that. Um, but the storyteller really has such a key role and will help you to understand the data better. Okay. So again, here's some additional resources if you want to um, pull those up, if you think it's like a really important idea, but you don't have to. So um, another piece that I think is really powerful is that people are interesting, not numbers. So somebody reading numbers off to you is like one of the most boring things in the world. Um, so really making that real is very, very critical. Um, for example, um, when I was the principal at Booker T. Washington High School for the Performing and Visual Arts in Dallas, you know, obviously it was an arts, it was a magnet high school with an arts focus. One of the things that we kept noticing was that our students would get all of these amazing, like full ride scholarships to NYU, to SMU, whatever, in the arts, but they could not accept those scholarships because they didn't meet the minimum academic qualification. And I had all the numbers to back me up and all that, but I couldn't seem to get anybody concerned about it except me. So I took one of our students um, who was beloved, quite honestly, by everybody in the faculty, and I used him as a part of my data story and about the fact that uh, we knew he came from a, a very challenging background, but his only hope of going to college was going to be a full ride scholarship. He was incredibly talented. And I named off all the places where he got full ride scholarships that he couldn't accept. And the teachers were in shock. And then I brought in the numbers and the data and said, this is what I've been trying to get across is we have a large number of students. It was about 20% of our student population who couldn't accept Division I 
extremely um, powerful scholarships to some of the best universities in the country because we weren't taking care of the academics. And that provided a real leverage point for all of us. Um, so anyway, just more about that. So remember, you have to have that compelling point um, that's going to get everybody involved. You also have to have an emotional impact. Like I said, when I told the story about a student who was beloved by everybody on the entire faculty and staff, it really did have an emotional impact. Because how sad was it that he was offered, you know, a hundred and fifty thousand dollar full ride scholarship to NYU, and he could not accept it. Talk about emotional really, really important way to hit people. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, let's end on this quote. Leaders become great not because of their power, but because of their ability to empower others. So remember, as a leader, whether you're a teacher leading a team or department, a principal or an assistant principal, a coach, um, or a superintendent, it's your job to tell the story to convince others that the data matters, and to make sure that we are creating a way for teams and PLCs to meet and talk about the most critical pieces. We have to have that sense of urgency as well as that moral purpose. Um, so the data story really can establish that well for us. We also have to have that relentless focus on eliminating gaps um, and ensuring that there is achievement for all. And guys, when we do this and we do it well, I promise you, it will do more to move student achievement than just about anything that we can do. And there's nothing more gratifying and satisfying. I know when I was at MacArthur High School in Irvine, and we reached that exemplary level. And then we were named the a Blue Room School of Excellence. Then we were named by the Intel Foundation as the best school in America. Talk about something to celebrate. I mean, the entire community um, just went wild um, because we were able to do, and it, it wasn't me as the principal that did it. I just had the most amazing group of teachers and faculty and staff that worked their butts off through collaboration and team building and all of these things to make that happen. And like I said, I, I'm still kind of amazed about the number of former students that I'm friends with on Facebook or Instagram or whatever that still talk about how amazing those times were. It really is probably one of the most powerful things you can possibly do. Okay. So, any questions or comments? I'm trying to read the chat real quick here, sorry. Um, so, school culture. Um, it is a subjective piece. Um, but, um, for example, um, there are several instruments that can be used to kind of look at culture. Um, I know like some people do student surveys, some people do student surveys, climate surveys, parent surveys. Um, there's a lot of different, very objective tools that you can use that can look at culture. Um, but there are also very subjective elements. Um, you know, and, and part of it goes back to, um, and I'm pulling from EDL 700, um, Great culture is created in a school when there's alignment between mission, vision, values, and the work. So, you know, I know at MacArthur, we kept it really simple. Our mission was, uh, you know, very simple. We had even had a tagline, all of that. Everybody knew it. Um, and we asked ourselves all the time, um, you know, how is this meeting the needs of? And we had two, two distinct things we did. In every single PLC meeting, we had two chairs that were empty at the front of the room. One of them was our student chair. That was, we named her that student Amber. The other was a teacher who we named Bob. Um, Bob was a very challenging teacher. Anytime we said, we're all going to go right, he would be, nope, I'm going left. So we would constantly ask ourselves before we made any decision, how does this impact Amber? Is this what's best for Amber, our student? Then how's Bob going to react and how do we plan for that? So we were very intentional about building culture. Um, and I mean, this may sound crazy, but when you get a very sound, great culture, people just know it. People can, can look to it and say, what a great school culture. 
But like I said, there are objective measures that you can use as well. Um, oh, Caitlin, I'm glad to hear that there's a school doing this. <laughs> you want to share a little bit? I hate to put you on the spot, but do you mind kind of talking about your school? Or Ashley? Just unmute yourself. <laughs> Okay, Kaylin said, Ashley, it's you that gets to talk. <laughs> it's okay, I, I shouldn't put you guys on the spot. <laughs> Go ahead, Ashley. It reminds us, it reminds us of exactly what we go through when we sit in our PLCs. You know, we all have our packs of data and we have to compare, you know, find those pieces that are those areas where I mean, it does. It sounds exactly like what our BLCs look like at our school. That's awesome. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways to run a school, but I will tell you in all of the research um, that has been done around effective schools and how to not only improve student achievement, but once you get it to the level you want it to be, it's really, really hard to sustain it. Um, I know we worked harder to just sustain that exemplary rating than we ever did getting to it. Um, and so um, all the research says that if you will follow basically the model. Way. Yeah, I'm sorry, Ashley, go ahead. No, it's okay. We do find ourselves reverting back to our old ways, kind of like you said, when you walk in data meetings and you hear them talking about the budget and what we need to do for field trips. And we do, I mean, we do it still, but and you just know when you walk out of those meetings and you go, okay, we didn't get anything out of that. Yeah. That was a waste. Yeah. So following, you know, there's a different protocol driven by data is, is research proven, as is the DataWise project from Harvard. That's data proven. Um, and the PLC framework and information that DuFour started back in 1998 are proven strategies that work. Um, so if you're doing anything else, you know, there's no magic bullet program, you know, or anything like that, that you can do. It all comes down to people understanding the data, looking and making sure the curriculum is good um, and it's gonna meet the needs and aligning that to assessment. Um, and I'll give you a great example. Um, how many of you guys are in districts or parishes where the district gives you the curriculum? Just kind of wave at me and tell me if you're in that position. When I was principal at Booker T, and I told you, you know, our kids were soaring in the arts and we weren't meeting their needs academically. I was really hammering my teachers. Are you teaching the curriculum? You know, is this the line? Blah, blah, blah. And I had a very brave group of people who would push back against me, which I needed. And my science department chair looked at me and he said, Tracy, he said, the curriculum sucks. And I'm like, but we're supposed to follow the district curriculum. He's like, it sucks. He said, it, it doesn't assess. It does, it's not aligned. All of those things. And he said, well, you trust us as department chairs to do what we know needs to be done and not follow the curriculum. He said, we'll pull the good pieces, but we'll create our own. And, you know, as a leader, as the principal, I knew my entire job <laughs> was on the line if we didn't achieve what we needed to. But I knew I had amazing teachers. And I said, sure, I'll trust you guys. So I turned them loose. And they tore that curriculum apart. They pulled some good out of it. They created some other stuff. And we went, our scorers went through the roof that year. And I was flabbergasted. I never expected, I knew we'd, we'd probably do okay, but I never expected. So much so that then I'm getting calls from the curriculum writers, you know, at the district level, like, what did y'all do? And I said, I let the teachers teach what they knew needed to be taught. And we quit using your curriculum. So the byproduct of that was that suddenly all of my teachers, they wanted them to be the curriculum writers for the summer. Um, but there has to be that organizational and relational trust to let teachers do what they know needs to be done and equipping them with all kinds of tools. Make sense? Oh, and if you're not reading the chat, look at some of this, because like Caitlin just posted some really good information. Yeah, and Kaylee, you're right. 
you're very lucky because a lot of administrators think the more they control, the better the results will be, when in reality, the less you do control as a leader. And you give trust with support within parameters and you provide all the tools and resources teachers need, you will get the outcomes you want. You really will. I've seen it happen over and over and over again. And those principals who tried to control every single thing, they didn't get the results. Yeah, Brandy, you're right. Nobody knows your students better than you. That's why the work belongs to those closest to the students. It doesn't belong anywhere else. Any other comments or questions? Because we're about to run out of time. Okay, well, it's 7.56 according to my clock, so I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting and give you four minutes of your life back. Um, hope you guys have a great week and weekend, and I will talk to you next week. Thanks. Bye.